Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Happy Easter. Or, as millions of Americans think of it, the day before Monday. Although, 79% of Americans do plan on celebrating Easter in some way this year. Last year, only 32% went to church on Easter, mostly online. 28% said they were planning on going to church this year, today. 31% plan on doing an Easter egg hunt for their kids, though, which doesn't quite make sense to me because... 79% of parents plan on decorating Easter eggs. So what are they going to do with them? Put them back in the carton? Sit around the house eating hard-boiled eggs? Happy Easter, kids. Need some water to choke down those egg yolks? 44% of us plan on visiting family and friends. 59% plan on cooking an Easter meal. I guess everyone else is just going to go hungry today. 60% of parents say they're carrying on the Easter traditions from their childhood. 52.4% of Americans, after putting a lot of thought into it, say the Easter bunny came before the Easter egg. So now we know. Load off my mind. But the world record for the largest chocolate Easter egg is 6,513 pounds heavier than the world's largest chocolate bunny, which makes me think they have it backward. What is the right way to eat a chocolate bunny? I mean, most people go for the ears first. But I usually try to make a clean kill, get the entire head, It's more humane. (laughs) And even though only 79% of parents plan on celebrating Easter and buying candy, 81% plan on stealing candy from their kids' stash. So you better watch your candy today, kids. Anyway, these are the top family Easter activities according to this same poll. You see anything missing? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with slurch. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad about any of this stuff. I didn't grow up going to church either, let alone on Easter. I didn't know Easter had anything at all to do with Jesus. It was all eggs and bunnies at our house. I was so completely ignorant about Easter that when I was 14 years old, I wrote an English paper on how Easter was the stupidest of all the holidays. I brilliantly pointed out that all the other holidays, they had some kind of religious or national significance. But Easter, that was as silly as having a holiday for like the tooth fairy. I was probably just bitter because as a kid, I was too fat and too slow to get any candy in those Easter egg dashes. True story. Anyway, at 14, I was a brand new Christian at 14, and my English teacher was not a believer in the slightest. So she really enjoyed pointing out to her know-it-all Jesus freak student the connection between Easter and the Christian religion. As a culture, I think we're working overtime to raise a whole bunch of people who are going to be as clueless as I was. The most important thing we can do every Easter is make sure that we tell the story so people actually know what Easter is about and then talk about the implications of what that story means for all of us. On Good Friday, Jesus finished what he came to do. He died as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And then, in the biblical way of counting, on the third day, he rose from the dead. Three days, Friday, 
Saturday, Sunday. I know that's not how we would count them. The fact remains, those are three days. Friday was horrific. Death is always horrific. And then Saturday, man, Saturday had to just be the worst. It had to be the longest day in the history of the world. Everything the followers of Jesus had hoped for, this new life, all their dreams, all that seemed to die with Jesus. So what now? They just ran away and hid. They figured they, figured they would be hunted down and killed next. Do you even bother to pray when you just watched your God die? Saturday had to be the most hopeless day that had ever happened. On Sunday, the women came out of hiding. They had work to do. They went to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus with burial spices. It was so incredibly sad. They were just doing the things that people did back then when they buried their loved ones. It seems like the Jewish leaders were the only ones who remembered that Jesus had said he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. They didn't believe it, but they sure didn't want the Christians to steal the body and start spreading rumors about resurrection. So they convinced Pilate to put armed Roman guards at the gravesite to keep it secure. But when the women showed up early on that first Easter morning, the stone had been rolled away. The Roman guards had abandoned their post. There were a couple of angels sitting on the tomb, patiently waiting for them to arrive. Why do you seek the living among the dead? That angel had a way with words. <laughs> if the women would have had a social media account, that would have made a great post. He is not here. He is risen. They run back home to tell the boys. On their way, Jesus meets them on the road. I think there's a really sweet moment when Jesus lets his mom know that he's okay. When they do get back to the house, the guys don't believe them. A couple of them, they run to the tomb to see what's really going on. There were another two disciples who had decided to completely get out of town. And they ended up having a long talk with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Later, Jesus shows up at the house where all the boys were hiding. Shades drawn, lights off, and they find out it's true. Jesus is alive. He did it. He came back from the dead. <laughs> then he spent the next 40 days hanging out with his friends, answering their questions, getting them ready for the rest of their new lives, helping them to understand that they were to continue the work that he had started with them. And this thing was far from over. Their hope was anything but lost. I'm going to jump to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, a letter that was written to a church of mostly Gentile, non-Jewish Christians, a small church, probably about 100 people, a lot like our church in a lot of ways. It was written less than 20 years after the resurrection, but a lot had happened in that time. It was also written by one of those religious leaders who wanted to silence all that noise about Jesus. Someone who wanted to kill all the misguided Christians who kept talking about some resurrected Messiah. It was written by a guy who the post-resurrection Jesus showed up and gave him a little attitude adjustment. I mean, a pretty big attitude adjustment, actually. He went from being the leader of the people trying to shut the church down to becoming the most influential person in the church as it took the gospel out to the rest of the world. St. Paul not only wrote 1 Corinthians, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And his ministry partner wrote the gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts, which are word for word, 
more than half the New Testament all by themselves. I think we should hear these words of St. Paul with as much astonishment as we can possibly muster up. Because this is a guy who thought Jesus was a fraud until Jesus showed up and said, why are you persecuting me? This is 1 Corinthians 15. It's also known as the resurrection chapter. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the gospel. This gospel saves you if you continue to believe it. And this is the gospel. You ready? This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. It's simple. But I don't want you guys to miss this. Christ died for your sins. What does that mean? If I were to ask you to write down an answer to that question, I think very few of you would get that answer right. Because this is what it means. It means that when God returns at the end of time to pour out his wrath on all the wickedness of the fallen world, just like Noah and the flood, only with fire, I mean, you really want to be on the ark this time. And the ark is Jesus. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, you want to walk away following Jesus without looking back. Like the final plague in Egypt, the death of the firstborn, you better have the blood of the lamb on the door of your house. Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sin has already marked you for death. But Jesus died in your place and marked you for life. The good news of the gospel is that you're with Jesus now. So you're going to be okay when he comes back down here. It's not just about going to heaven. This is about surviving the apocalypse. (laughs) I'll bet you never thought about it like that before. But that's only part of the story. Because Jesus didn't just die for your sins. He wasn't just buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day. That's the reason we're here today. And maybe, maybe that's the part for you, the part that's hard for you to believe. Because, I mean, everyone dies. We've all seen that. But we've never seen anyone come back. And Paul knows that's the hard part to swallow. That's why he's got a lot more to say about it. Verse 5. The resurrected Jesus was seen by Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. In other words, if you don't believe me about Jesus coming back from the dead, ask around. Most of these people were still alive. It was only a few years ago. And then he says, last of all, I saw him myself. He's like, you know, I used to be against this whole Christianity thing, right? Well, seeing Jesus back from the dead, that's what changed my mind. Then he addressed the skeptics. Verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised then all your preaching is useless and your faith is useless. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. They're lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Some people might be like, 
I don't think he literally came back from the dead. It's just a really powerful idea, you know, that idea of resurrection. It's a wonderful, beautiful concept. But Paul says, that's hogwash. If Jesus didn't really come back from the dead, then all this gospel talk and Jesus stuff, it's a bunch of nothing. It's completely useless. You're still in your sins. You're going to die in your sins. And God's going to come down here, and you're going to be on your own to face his judgment. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. See, that is the gospel truth. And this is what it means. Jesus is the first harvest, the first fruit of the resurrection. You're all going to rise from the dead, just like Jesus did. He just went first. See, death came into the world through Adam. And resurrection came into the world through Jesus. Just like everyone dies because of their connection to Adam and his sin, everyone who belongs to Christ will be raised to new life. So when's this going to happen? He says there's an order to this plan. First, Christ was raised. And then everyone who belongs to him will be raised when he comes back. And then it's game over. Jesus will destroy every ruler and power, which is a reference to the kingdoms of the world and the devil, when everyone who stands in opposition to God is destroyed. Verse 25, for Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Sometimes people talk about death as if it's our friend, as if it's just a natural part of life. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is not our friend. If there's no resurrection of Jesus or for all of us, then there's no hope. There's no point to any of this. But he knows the skeptics still have some questions. So verse 35, but someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? Like what if they died a long time ago? What if they were eaten by a shark? You might have similar questions. I had a great high school science teacher. Mr. Likes, he didn't pull any punches and he had no trouble teaching science from a foundation of Christian faith. Thanks to him, I have never believed there was any tension at all between faith and science. I think he might be the first person who pointed this next thing out to me. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change from one form to another. Okay, well, human beings have measurable energy. I've always thought of this as our soul. So where does that energy go when we die? It's got to go somewhere. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. Everything runs down. Unless an outside force does something to re-energize it. So you put these two ideas together, and I call this the gospel according to Einstein. When a person dies, their soul goes somewhere. First law. But it's only going to get worse and weaker unless an outside force, in this case God, does something to it. Second law. So you might think resurrection is just too much of a stretch, too hard to believe. But I don't think so. I think we're surrounded by all kinds of resurrections. Everywhere we look, seeds go into the ground and die, and then new life comes from it. Almost everything we eat has to die in order to give us life. 
We can find resurrection in nature everywhere, all around us. Things die and then they come back as something else. Every living thing is like energy. It can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change from one form to another. Resurrection is built into the way reality works. So trust the science. <laughs> Verse 42. It's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. Every cemetery is a garden waiting for the harvest. God is the external power of your salvation. At the end of time, when Christ comes back for all his people, when we've all been changed into those heavenly, glorified bodies in our resurrection, that's when this scripture will be fulfilled. The one that says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Some of the sting of death has already been taken away because we believe what Jesus promised us. Because he rose from the dead, he shows what's going to happen to us. But we have to be honest. Death still stings. It's still horrible. We still grieve when people die. But we don't grieve like people who have no hope. Not anymore. You're going to be resurrected like Jesus in your own body, except without sin, which is something we can barely imagine. Our body without corruption, without sickness, without fear of ever dying again, without fear of losing the people we love. See, this is why we all showed up here today, to remember the story of Easter and what it means for all of us. So we can pass the story and this hope on to our children and to their children so they can have the same hope that we do, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and it all hinges on Easter, that he was raised from the dead on the third day. It's also why we show up here every week, to encourage each other, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that Christ has died, past tense. He won't die again. That Christ is risen, present tense, ongoing, like church is happening right now, and that Christ will come again, future tense. This is what we're hoping for. Say this with me, it's on the screen. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.